Yoko Gum Go, Go, Fight Fans to the Fighters Boys Kick Ass Podcast. Your Fight Talk Authority. Not to mention the most entertaining and talked about podcast with your kick ass host, Richard Ortiz. You mad? Come at me, bro. And his loyal kick ass co host, Senor Cole Escovito. Streaming live and worldwide. Coming to you all the way live from a little place somewhere in Cali. The Fighters Boys Kick Ass Podcast. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Fighter's Voice Kick-Ass Podcast. we got a great show for you tonight. Join us in studio. I want to say in studio because he looks like he's just right next to me, but by way of Zoom, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I usually give this gentleman an introduction, but lately, I mean, no introduction needed. He, he's reached that plateau, ladies and gentlemen, and, and we're talking about one of the finest, one of the best in the business. If you got a bloody mess, you want to call this guy because he'll put it to rest and stop the bleeding. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy's all over PBC. He's all over the circuit. He's all over pay-per-view. I mean, next time you put the fights on, I don't even know if you want to see the fighters fight or just see this, my man, stop the bleeding. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rodriguez, the cut man himself. What's up, Richard? How you guys doing tonight? Doing good, Mike, man. Uh, you know, I always go over the top on the introductions, man. But you know what? You, you've earned it. I mean, we, we've talked about um, you just, uh, I don't even want to say climbing the charts. And, and all you did was just continue to grind and take every opportunity and just knock it out. You know, I think that's the, that's the big thing. Is it's, just, it's a matter of taking advantage of, of opportunities and, 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 and building those bridges and having a model of consistency that, that, that people can count on. And that's really, that's, that's really what I try to do. Um, I try to do that in my everyday job as, as a homicide detective, and, you know, from when I was in the military. And, and you just try to, you put your hard hat on every day, and, and it's that old Vince Lombardi saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Well, Mike, you've made good in every opportunity. And, and you know, today's show's going to be a little different. We always go into, you know, what's going on in, in the world. But uh, well, we've got to kind of stay on task tonight. I, I want to talk about uh, so, some of the uh, the fighters and, 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 and life in the bubble. And, and not only just for the cut, man, not only just for the promoters and, and everybody that, that handles the promotion, but the fighters themselves, how they have to adjust to, to, to the bubble. And we're talking about some big names. We're talking about you got your Theofimos, you got your Lomas, your, your Ryan Garcinas, uh, your Haney, and, and you got Tank, and you got all the above. I mean, you as a cut man, you've already made that adjustment. But as, as a fighter, I'm going to put you in the, in the fighter's corner there because you've been in, in a lot of uh, big corners and big events. What adjustments do you recognize that the fighters have made the easiest and which has been the most difficult? Well, I think, you know, through the whole pandemic now, we're working on basically almost 10 months to the day, you know, when things kind of shut down and, and life as we know it, you know, has changed. I've, I've literally, even though I live in L.A. and my parents, you know, live up in the Bay Area, I, you know, I, I've seen I've seen my family, my parents, you know, I've seen them one time. My dad's probably not complaining, you know, but my mom probably misses me a little bit. Um, it's just different for everybody. And when you take a... Think of your everyday life and, and how things are different and you can't go into a restaurant or maybe you're a little leery about about going to Target or you want to meet up with friends just, just to be social because we're, we're social creatures. I mean, that's why they invented Zoom and FaceTime and, you know, and social media. It's because we are social creatures. I mean, at least some people are. We all got relatives that don't like nobody and they, they're perfectly cool with all this. Yeah. I'm not going to mention any names, but... Um, yeah. I think, and now you're asking a fighter to not only just have an everyday life, but now they have to perform at a high level. And, and I think just their freedom being restricted because of the protocols, which are totally needed. So for one, if they're in that bubble, and, and I'll give you a little example. You know, I, I worked the PBC bubble, and I'm fortunate that the, that the LA fights for Fox and Fox Sports 1 are here in LA, so I'm local. So the one example is, is I have a, we have a separate entrance where we enter a hotel, you know, usually downtown L.A., near L.A. Live. And first thing you do is you check in, but you're not checking in with the hotel. You know, you're not, you're not doing that. You're basically checking in so that you can get tested. And as soon as you fill out the paperwork and you get tested, they send you up to another floor where uh, usually, you know, our, our good friend uh, Nancy Alvarez is there with a big old smile and she's giving you your room key. And you're stuck in that room, you know, until your test clears the, 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 the next day. Almost like, almost like a holding cell. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I worked county jail at, at, in, you know, in L.A., so I, I, I know what that's like. And, and you go into a little bit of an isolation, and it really puts you in a different mind frame because people always tell me, oh, you're lucky you get to go to this hotel and that hotel. I'm like, there's just something mentally when you know that your, your movement and your freedom is, is restricted. And, and, and granted, it's, it's needed. It's, it's voluntary. This is what we sign up for. But now you already have the a fighter's mindset where they're getting ready to, they've probably been there for a few days before me, you know, because they have obligations still to the press, whether it be on Zoom, you know, they, they, they have other things they need to do, like make weight and stuff like that. And it's an added pressure in it, you know, with, with mental health and mental health issues being at an all-time high, you know, you could see where the anxiety level, where you don't have those comforts where like a lot of fighters, hey man, I'm, I need to burn off some anxiety and call their trainer up. Let's go hit the gym. Let's go shake out. A lot of those things now are a little bit different for them. You know, their, their food and their diet and everything that they can do. And, and what are we doing? And you know how critical everybody in the sports world is, specifically boxing. They're still being asked to perform at a high level. You don't make weight by three ounces. All of a sudden, you're a fat guy that can't make weight. And you know how critical people are. So my hat's off to them because I've worked with, just in the bubble, I've worked with some tremendous fighters. I've worked with Erislande Lara. I've worked with I've worked with Errol Spence. I've wor worked with Jordanis Ugas, Jose Cito Lopez. I mean, uh, uh, Jessica McCaskill. And I went into the bubble over there with with her for the matchroom fights in in, in in Oklahoma. And it was like about 115 degrees outside with 115 degree humidity. I mean, she literally had to fight like in a thunderstorm, you know. And so, and she beat Cecilia Breckhouse, who was undefeated, who was getting ready to break, I believe, um, uh, I think it was Rocky Marciano's record for most title defenses. I mean, or Joe Lewis or somebody like that. And she ended up pulling a huge upset. And her trainer, Rick Ramos, who kind of, if you know Rick, and I believe I put you guys in, in touch with them, you know, he really was the mastermind of all that. All that. Shout out, I mean, shout out, shout out, real quick, shout out to Rick and congratulations on his uh, podcast that he, he started, uh, I believe it was this week. And him and, and uh, uh, Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so they're, 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 those are people that have taken advantage of their opportunities during this time, and they continue to, to, to build their brand. So um, just going back to your question, I probably answered it 10 different ways like I like to do. Um, my mom used to call me the walking TV guy because, you know, when my parents were driving in the car, uh, my sister was younger, so she would just sit there. My brother would kind of just stare out the window, and there was me right there because my aunts and uncles would call me ears. And I'd be riding between my parents, just, 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 just yapping away. And she'd call me the walking TV guide. So when, whenever you ask me a question, you know, I'm always going to peel the onion back, and I'm going to give you a lot of different answers. But my hats off to these athletes, these fighters, who risk a lot as it is, um, that they're able to accomplish this, and their and their trainers and their whole teams behind them. Not only that, you said the mental part that they just don't crack. You know that they're just they're mentally strong because. Yeah, we do love to socialize, and especially fighters. They vibe off, off energy. They vibe off the public. Some go into their own quarantine, even before quarantine started. They love privacy, but they want to be in charge. I mean, getting in the bubble and, and listening to somebody is one thing. Volunteer is, is another. And I want to talk to uh, about some fighters that are getting ready to make that tra transition in the bubble, and I wish the big names would. And I'm talking about the Walter Waite division. I'm talking about, as we, you know it, uh, history has it. you got the Tommy Hearnses, the Sugar Ray Leaners, the Marvin Haglers, the Roberto Durans. And what made these fighters great, what made them special, Mike, is they fought each other. Win, lose, or draw, they left it all in the ring, and they respected each other. One may beat one and get beat by the other. And I'm asking you, what four can we put, maybe even five, maybe even six, in that equation today, we're talking about the Crawfords, the, the Spence, the, the Porters, uh, the Ortizes, uh, even the Regis Pro Grace, if he chooses to move up to uh, 147. The winner of Ramirez and, uh, oh gosh, uh, Taylor. Ross uh, Taylor. Yeah, can easily be put in that equation. But here's my question, Mike. Who's going to dare themselves to be great? Who's well, you're going to dare themselves to be great. You already know that Manny Pacquiao, who's there, has well, already... I, I saved the best for last, my man. Yeah, you already know that Manny... The it center, might be Garcia. You know, he's he's already dared to be great because he already is great, a division 
world champion and, you know, and hats off to his old team with, with Freddie Roach and Marie over a wild card and Sean Gibbons and all the other people that, that, that make that happen. Um, and that's the great thing. And I, I was reading something on social media that here you have Manny Pacquiao and he's still entertaining being in big fights in 2021 when he was in these big fights in 1998. That's just unheard of. That'd be like you and I in the, you know, that'd be like you and I in the year 2042. God willing, you know, we're still going to be here. Um, and, and they're still talking about, these guys are still talking about the same thing as, you know, 21, 22 years later. Um, I recently had a chance to work with Errol Spence when he worked with, when he fought Danny Garcia uh, on a pay-per-view over in Texas at Texas Stadium. It was my third time there, you know, where the Cowboys play. Um, I'm working the fights, the, the PBC fights with Ruben Chavez, the other cut man here in L.A. Danny Milano, who's who's the, not just the man and, and, and cut men in general, one of the top guys, you know, on the East Coast. Um, you know, Danny's listening. What's up, bro? Um, I, I, we chatted a little bit earlier, and we, we, uh, we talked a little bit of cut man history. Danny works the, 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 the corners over for PBC for uh, Showtime and during the uh, over in Connecticut. So when they do the pay-per-views in Texas, they bring him and I out there together. And, you know, we had a chance to be part of that, that, that big event and work with Errol Spence. And I had worked with Errol, you know, earlier in his career. And even though there was in a, in a stadium that, that holds, you know, 70, 80,000 people, it was nice just having that 15,000 people in there, you know. And that was a real fight for Errol Spence. It was a comeback fight after his, after his accident. And fortunately, he's okay. But when you look at the landscape at 147, we haven't even gotten to, you know, to lightweight at 135. You know, when you have Errol and you have Manny and, and you have guys like Keith Thurman and obviously Terrence, Terrence Crawford and, and you have guys like your Dennis Ugas and you have Sean Porter. Um, and you even got guys like Keith Thurman. Yeah, Keith Thurman. And Keith Thurman. And then you got those guys that you mentioned at 140 that are looking like they're ready to break out to move up to 147. The Jose Ramirez is the Josh Taylors, the Regis Prograis. You know that are that are all live dogs, and 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 it, it makes for a good combination because the one feeling I get, and you get these feeling with guys like Spence and, and Manny and, and, and Sean Porter and even Ugas, is that they all want the big fights. I mean, I, I hey Sean Porter, man, I, I worked with Sean and I had a chance to work his last fight, and I worked with him during his title run when he first won the title from Devin Alexander at Barclays Center in New York. I mean, Sean's ready for that work. I mean, he's he's if you sign him up. I mean, and you gotta. You got to take your hat off to a fighter like that, and Sean um, is, a, is a completely tough out for for anybody. Nobody's ever had a, a walk in the park with Sean, and I just think that's what made you. When you look at the era of, of Benitez and and, and, and Hearns and, and and Duran and Leonard, um, you even go back to the late '90s when you had you know De La Hoya and Trinidad and Vernon Forrest, and Shane Mosley, and Fernando Vargas, and Ike Corte and Ricardo Mayorga. I mean, and I, if I'm leaving, so, oh, if I'm leaving somebody else, slap me. You know, those guys, they were all interchangeable, man. And it was it was great for what? It was great for the sport of boxing. Yeah. I, I, um, I was a fan favorite of also Acacia Zoo. He kind of slid in there a little bit, made some noise in there toward, towards the end. But uh, that's after the smoke was cleared. But yeah, they did face each other, the Fernando Vargas and uh, I Cortez. And, uh, but but today's fighter, uh, today's fighters, I don't want it just to be the should have, would have, and could have. I mean, we're all waiting for – Spence and, and, and Crawford, I really don't think it's going to happen in 2021. I, I, I don't see evidence of it. Today, recently, news, news broke. I don't know if anybody can confirm it just yet, but they may be working on Mikey Garcia and Terrence Crawford. If that fight takes place, Mike, quickly, what, what's your take? J just to analyze it real quickly so we can move on to some others. Possibly match you got two tremendous fighters with that one thing that I love to talk about, championship pedigree. Both have been in a great fight. Just because Mikey lost to Errol Spence doesn't negate anything. Sugar Ray Leonard lost to Roberto Duran. Wilfred Benitez lost to Sugar Ray Leonard. Tommy Hearn lost to Sugar Ray Leonard. You know, so, I mean, people just want to see what? They want to see compelling fights. And I think, you know, although I work in the business, I'm still a fan. And I, and I have to admit that sometimes the fights, sometimes they're less compelling to me. But when I get a fight like that, you know, when I look at the, the, the young guns, they're a lightweight or even the welterweight or a lot of other divisions, maybe even Canelo, they're, they're must-see TV. That's what brings the fans in and gets people – that's what gets people talking. That's what you grew up with. That's what I grew up with, going to my Uncle Joe's house and watching fights with my dad and my uncles 
And a big shout out to my uncle Tony, my uncle Bobby, because they all and my, and my Nino Jamie Adams. They always tune into the fights, and, and and my cousin Lupe Garcia. When I think of fights, and I think of watching Norton and Ali and Frazier, those people that I just mentioned that mean so much to me. Those are the first people that come to my mind when I think of why I love this sport and why I pursued it. You know, post during my law enforcement career that I've turned a hobby you know, into a legitimate business. It's for that reason right there. Exactly. And, and you know what? I know the feeling. I know exactly where, where you're coming from. It, it's, it, it's sometimes that's why we wake up in the morning. I mean, we can't wait back in the day. We can't wait to read uh, while here in Fresno, the Fresno Bee, because that was our only source of information. And um, or, or the barbershop, you had your barbershop talk. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and not only that, I mean, most of us, I remember going to Tower Records and they had Tower Books and you get in your Ring Magazine and your Boxing Illustrated and your KO Magazine and, you know, you're pulling out that, you're pulling out that, uh, that centerpiece and it's not yeah. like you're looking, most of the time at our age, we were looking at what? We were looking at Playboy and Penthouse, <laughs> but I was looking to pull out the, 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 the new poster of, you know, Larry Holmes or Tommy Hearns. Yeah. Yeah. The other magazines, I don't, don't tell my mom, but the other magazines I had to put underneath I had to put underneath my bed that I stole from my dad that she didn't even know he had. <laughs> but that's an Oprah. That's an Oprah for a different day. And, and I'm sure he had his own rankings, his own top ten in that magazine as well. Yeah, in that magazine, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know I did. Yeah, absolutely. Let's not forget the Ring magazine. You would open it up, and they'd have the weight divisions there. Absolutely, and they even used to do the the. Um, you know the world rankings for the for the amateur. It was sponsored by Budweiser, I, and, and the closet just yes. to, just to my left. Um, my mom actually saved a, a big box for me, and I actually have a nice little cachet of old boxing and wrestling magazines because you know professional wrestling is real, bro. If Absolutely. you're a Mexican kid growing up in a railroad town, and, and your opportunities for uh, for uh, entertainment are, are are limited, roller derby. And professional wrestling were real, and you couldn't convince, you couldn't convince my grandfather the wrestling wasn't real. That was uh, right before I was an American Bandstand, I, I believe it, it was uh, roller derby, man. Yeah, I used to watch, believe it or not, we used to watch my dad every Saturday morning would watch Soul Train. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. I mean, I, listen, and I seen evidence of that. Uh, the last time uh, we were in uh, at the MGM Grand, I mean, you and myself, and uh, we had a good time, man. Listen to those, listen to those music, man. Listen to that music, man. And that just takes me back to Saturday mornings, and you know, listen to Don Cornelius. And my dad always used to repeat what he said on Soul Train. He'd say, "You can bet your last money, honey. It's or you can bet your last money. It's all going to be a stone gas, honey." And that was Don Cornelius. Hey, he had it down, man. And, and people would would just uh, the icon himself. Whatever he spoke, man, it, it was old. He was nice and cool, collective under pressure. Whenever he had a big guest, he was just, you never knew he was sweating, man. I mean, he was just so cool. And just so you know, and I didn't realize this till later, they never really sang on that show because you could actually hear the, you could actually hear the record fade out. And on a four minute song, he would play about a minute and 20 seconds. Exactly. Well, the Beastie Boys were on there and they dropped their mics, but I mean, the words were still going. So yeah. <laughs> Mike, I got to ask you, what has been the difference for you? We talked about fighters making that transition, but you as a cut man, has it had any effect in you with the crowd and without a crowd? You know, just like fighters feed on a crowd, um, you know, most of the time I walk out with the fighters. We come behind the curtain. He's got the music. The TV cameras are in front of us. Um, and even though I'm not fighting, but there's a part of all of us that in some way, shape, or form, we feel like we're coming out that curtain and, all those people are yelling and screaming for us. And maybe out of 20,000 people, there's probably like three people cheering for me. Um, and now it's it's kind of, did I lose you guys? No, 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 you're there. Okay, I don't see you. Or I think maybe somebody else is coming in. You got yeah, yeah, it, look, it looks like Carol's coming in. So um, now it's kind of like I, I, I walk out you know, before the event starts and you know, you're in a, in a studio type environment and it's it's, little, it's a little different because you can hear everything. The one good thing I will say, because I work in a lot of crowded arenas, is the ring space for those working the corners um, in big arenas during big fights is very limited. Well, now, because there's a lot of people eliminated from around ringside, you know, inside the interior of the corral there, um, I have all the room in the world. 
all the room in the world to work, which is actually good. And it's going to take me some used to used to again being in a cramped space and, and having my um, my movement limited. You know, we've talked earlier on the show about some of the fighters, the Fury Leonard's and what have you, and they opened the doors and inspired today's fighters, the, the Spence's, the, the, the Manny Pacquiao's, the Mikey Garcia's, etc. Let, let's talk about some of the, the, the cut men that have paved the way for you, that have paved the way for boxing, that often, like, that often get overlooked. I mean, that have stopped a, a bloody mess, that have, that have kept big fights from being stopped, rather, let me reword that, that have kept their fighter inside of the, uh, the ropes, kept them safe, and kept them into the fight. Well, you know, I think, um, and, you got, and, and you, I've tried to go back to the long lineage as best I could. You know, talking to guys like Stitch and Danny Milano, and and even before he passed, you know, Joe Chavez and and my good friend Ruben Gomez, um, and I've tried to kind of go back and like make kind of like a tree, and I'm going to give you some names that. Most of the people on here will probably not remember, but I'm going to mention them anyway, and then I'm going to get to the people that um, that are doing it now that have bridged that gap. And you're talking about guys like Al Gavin, Eddie Aliano, Ralph Citro, Howie Albert, uh, Anto Dundee, who was Sugar Ray Leonard, Muhammad Ali's trainer, was was an excellent cut man. Chuck Bodak, uh, Joe Souza. Um, Ace Murata, Joe Chavez, uh, Jimmy Glenn, um, uh, uh, Ruben Gomez, um, Indian Willie Shunke, who passed away a couple years ago, Miguel Diaz. I mean, these are guys that really paved the way. And if I'm leaving anybody out, slap me. And then you got the one guy that I look at now that kind of bridged that gap um, from that old to the new and kind of took boxing cut men out of the Stone Ages, and that's Jacob Stitch Durand, who I've known, you know, since I was 19 years old. And then you got the guys that I that I see, you know, you consistently see the same eight or nine guys around the world and nationally that are working with all the top fighters. And I'm very fortunate and blessed, you know, to be to be part of that. In addition to Stitch and Danny Milano, um, you know, you got Mike Basil, and and you got Rudy Hernandez, and you got Carlos Vargas. Um, you got Russ Anber, you know, from, from, from Canada, uh, Aaron Navarro and Bobby Benton over in Houston, Eddie Ackaway, a guy that has worked a lot of fights with some wild card guys and world champions. He doesn't work as much, but I totally respect his work. Um, you got Teddy Lucio and you got Mike Rella in New York and, and, and Levi Smith, who's worked with all the Broners and the Easters. You know, you got Joe Villanueva over and over and over in San Antonio. Um, you got my good friend Al Gamas and and and, um, and 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 Juan Ramirez, you know, down in San Diego, you know, and then you got some of the new blood, some of the guys that now I'm not going to say they're younger, or maybe they are, but like my son Andrew and and, and Carol, who's going to come on, you know, uh, in a little bit, and you got guys like um, um, Sal Cho and Mark Nieves, and even his dad, the Candyman. So I try to keep track of all these people because you try to build goodwill and bridges with all these people because you, I, I respect their work. And those are just the boxing guys. There's a whole list of MMA guys that primarily work in mixed martial arts that I'm very aware of, and I, and I, and I respect their work. And, you know, sometimes it kind of gets glossed over, but I don't gloss over those things, and I don't take it for granted because it's, it, it's, it's a craft and something that I take a lot of pride in, that I can physically do something, that I can physically do something that helps affect the fight in a positive way. And I take a lot of pride in that. You know, Mike, I'm going to say it for the record. This is possibly the only show where these fighters have finally been recognized. And uh, that was long overdue. And, and let's talk about the some just uh, the, 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 the ones just briefly when they were coming up. Were they a cut, man. They had yeah. duty. Like the, they had double duties, you know, like, like, um, Muhammad Ali's old, old uh, trainer, man, Angelo Dundee. You have guys that you got. You have guys that can do that now. Um, exactly. You know, Eddie Reynoso, the trains. Let, let, let me ask you this, Mike, and, and I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Kevin, you're working a fight, and something happened to the trainer. I mean, I, I don't know. Whatever excused him from the project. Are you yourself ready to take the helm? As far as the double duty. Stop Absolutely. I, I've done it several times. 
Joel Diaz is fighters. Uh, Joel had a Russian, a world-ranked Russian, that just fought a couple of weeks ago. And because of some COVID protocols, he wasn't able to make it. And he said, hey, Mike, I'm going to need you tonight, not just to be his cut man, but I'm going to need you to be his chief second. I've done that for Joel and several other uh, several other fighters over the years. And, you know, I'm glad that they entrust me with that. And, you know, I try to do the best job that I can. Exactly. Just give me one second. It looks like Carol's uh, going to join us. Carol, welcome to the show. I, I can't see the screen. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi, Richard. Hi, Mike. Hi, hey. Uh, you just got to go to it and, and hit the video so we can see you. Yeah, I can't. For some reason, I can't see it. It's not on here. It's not on my screen. Okay. Um, I just send you KP's number. I'll, I'll let you go ahead and give him a call, and uh, he'll, he'll walk you through it and just jump in whenever you're ready, Carol. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll be waiting. Well, Mike, I, okay. I, thank you. Oh, yeah. We, of course. Mike, I didn't mean to stop you there, man, but I had to ask you that because going into it, it's always – you perfect your craft – but you, you, and I know there's the only a, maybe a handful of other cut men that are very well rounded. Now, is that something that you started off as a trainer, and then you went to became a cut man, or was your passion always into stopping cuts, or was it just an opportunity that you filled? Um, I fell into it. I'm not going to say by accident. I was a training. I was training some guys, but because my regular job is a homicide detective, I couldn't be in the gym. And I'm going back like you know, 12, 13 years, I couldn't be in the gym taking guys to spar. And, you know, they were, I wasn't being brought fighters like, like Freddie, uh, you know, and, and, and Robert Garcia and the guys here in LA, Joel Diaz, Danny Zamora, Henry Ramirez, John Pullman. So I had never really paid attention much to what a, what a cut man did other than, you know, like I was like everybody else, like the guy on Rocky and they thought everybody actually cut him during the fight. There's people out there that actually think I have a razor blade and, and, you know, and I, and I cut guys, you know, in between rounds and it just, I talked to David Martinez, and I'm sorry if I didn't mention David earlier. I was driving back to some fights in your neck of the woods in Fresno from the old Fresno fairgrounds. There you go. And David has worked; he worked cuts for Miguel for Miguel Cotto and Oscar De La Hoya and a whole host of other world champions. And I just started asking him about it. And Dave's well, David was a reti was a, a medic in Vietnam, and he's very well respected. And he ran the La Habra Boys Club or La Habra Boxing Club for you know for 30 years, and unfortunately, it recently closed down. And I just started picking his brain. And it just so happened that, you know, Stitch Duran it was one of my boxing coaches in the Air Force. And I started picking his brain. I was friendly with Miguel Diaz and Ruben Chavez. And I told the story before, but I used to go to Joe Chavez's house in East L.A. because it was close to my work office. And he used to sell, he used to sell gauze and tape and, and, and buckets and you name it, whatever a fighter needed, gloves. Well, he started noticing that I started coming over like twice a week, buying all kinds of stuff. And then he figured out a couple of weeks later, I wasn't just buying this stuff because I, I needed new uh, more buckets. I started picking Joe's brain, and we became we became very close. And him and his wife Virginia um, were just the nicest people in the world. God rest Joe's soul. And he really just kind of kind of schooled me in a lot of ways. Um, Rudy Hernandez has been the same way. Rudy Rudy's a UFC cut man. Rudy's a trainer of boxing world champions. Rudy has worked cuts and trained with some of the biggest fights in the world. And, and Rudy's one of the guys that you know like Stitch and Carlos Vargas you know, in a Danny Milano that, that, that I kind of put, you know, on my Mount Rushmore. And obviously I got my contemporaries and people that I respect and they're hopefully I didn't leave anybody out because I equally respect all of them. It wasn't a ranking that I did. It wasn't a pound for pound. It was an inclusive list. Um, but once I decided that this is what I wanted to do and I liked it, um, I tried to learn everything I could about it. And first of all, I always wanted to make sure that I respected the craft because um, the, the people that I have just mentioned, you know, we're going back now. We're in 2020. We're talking about people, at least to my knowledge, that were doing this stuff in the 60s and very early 70s. And they're the ones that, because of them, I'm able to do what I do now. And that's why I take tremendous pride. And I've tried to instill that into my son, Andrew, because he's already worked world title fights. He's already worked with numerous world champions. And, and the training wheels are off. And he, I still get nervous when I see, you know, we worked a fight uh, last month at the wild card in those NBC fights where we worked opposite each other. The father and me still looking over while I'm working on my guy, making sure that his guy's okay, that he's doing good. And I don't think that'll ever go away. You're checking on him. Huh? And that's okay. It'll never go away. Well, we can see you now, Carol. How you doing? Okay, now we can't hear you, so we got to control that volume there. Yeah, yeah, we'll. We got the Helen Keller thing going on right now, man. You know, 
Uh, we, we do. And we're talking about the, those fights at Ring City USA, correct? Absolutely. And, uh, Carol, jump in whenever you feel free, whenever your mic's ready to go. There, there we go. Mike, I, I got to ask you, what are some of the different techniques that, that you've used to separate yourself from the pack? I mean, uh, was it put in a situation where you had to be forced in there because of a bad cut? Yeah, and this is something that, you know, that, that I've talked extensively about with Stitch and Mike Basil, Aaron Navarro, Danny Milano, Russ Amber, Rudy Hernandez. When everybody's sending me texts about what a great job I, I, I've done, I think I've done, Rudy will be the one like, hey, that was good, but did you think about doing this? And, that, and that's what you need. You need that, that give and take and that quality control. I think the one thing with new people starting off is they forget about the one thing that's going to make them successful, Richard. They forget about that their work speaks for themselves. And you're kind of smiling because you already know where I'm going to go with this. Exactly. Their work speaks for themselves. And they're not getting noticed because they got a personalized shirt with their goofy picture on it. They got a bunch of dirty swabs that you shouldn't put around an open wound in their ears or their nose or their mouth. They got a little gimmicky hat and they got some cute nickname. They're known because their work, their work speaks for themselves. And when the chips are down and when that fighter needs them most under a high pressure situation, and I worked one of the worst cuts I've ever worked just a few weeks ago with uh, J J Jelena M M Marinovich, who fought on Ring City. She fought Paula Torres for a women's world title. And she got cut in the fourth or fifth round. It was one of the worst cuts I've ever had. And, you know, having the respect of the ringside doctors when they come over in between rounds, say, okay, Mike, you look like you got it under control. But there were some tense moments there that, thank God, I was able to get through it. And she was greatly appreciative. But there are times when your fighter comes back to the corner. I can't protect them from getting hit again. I can't take the, the, the cut away. I'm not Jesus Christ. I never saw Jesus in my menudo. Like I had an uncle who did one time. <laughs> I, I, that guy. I, I, didn't, I never made wine out of water. Um, and I heard that one before about the menudo. I heard about the, 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 the clouds and, and maybe the tortilla kind of resembled them a little bit, but not the menudo, man. Yeah. So if you ever see Jesus in your menudo, call me and then we're going to play the lotto. Exactly. Let, let our, me, okay, go no, ahead. Real quick, but our job is when that fighter stands up, that you've addressed that trauma and that they're no longer bleeding. Now they're probably going to come back from head butts and getting hit again because they're in a fight and it's going to be and they're going to be bleeding again. I just see too many cut men. They're they're skipping steps because they want to do all the funny stuff. They want to have the nickname and they want everybody to know, hey, I'm the cut man because when I walk out, I got I got a stupid hat and I got my picture of my face on my shirt and all that stuff. But the work, the work is what counts. That's what you get known for is being dependable that in high pressure situations when there's a lot on the line that you're able to come through. And having that respect of your fighters and your peers is the most important thing. Let's leave the walkouts to the fighters because even when the fighters come in with the what 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 their you know what their wardrobe pop in the lights at the end of the day they still have to fight they still got to perform. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad you clarified that too, and and I can I can tell when you when you said you just see too much of it, and it kind of just you try to turn your head, but I'm glad you addressed it because it needs to be addressed. I'm I'm always you know what the one thing I always am is I'm very fact oriented. And it's, that's just the homicide military guy in me. I like things in an orderly fashion. I don't like, I probably get this from my dad. I don't like a lot of loosey goosey grab astical stuff. Um, but it's important. It's, it's important to me. There's only one guy right now that, that, that his name is, 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 is a brand, you know, and that's, that's stitched around. I mean, he was a UFC cup man. He's been in movies. He's taking what we do out of these stone ages. And I have tremendous respect for Jacob. Um, and But I see too many people that, that don't have championship pedigree. And they're already, you know, they got, they got their own, um, they got their own cup at 7-Eleven. I mean, it's just, I, and I, I, and that's to each his own, but you're asking me the question. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to give you the answer. No, enough said. We're in a brand new year, man. What, what are we expecting this year? And uh, 
Along the year, you already mentioned the ones that have paved the way for you, and you're so grateful for a lot of things, but what are the new lives that, that have come into your life, the, the new teams that, that have come into your 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 uh, side of the tracks that have continued to open doors? Because in, in everything in, every, in life, Mike, we never stop learning, even on the, on your personal job. No, no, and and that relationship that I that I built, you know, with the wild card with Freddie and Marie and all of the wild card fighters from from Manny Pacquiao on down. And I look sometimes and I and I, I sit in the gym and I try to get there whenever I can. It's more limited now because of just safety protocols, you know. And I'm like, I'm in here with Freddie Roach, and, and Freddie Roach likes having me around. And he he depends on me with his guys. You know, I work with the bread man, Stephen Edwards, over in Philadelphia. I work with Joel Diaz. I work with Ronnie Shields. I work with Robert Garcia. You know, locally, I work with Henry Ramirez, John Pullman, um, Danny Zamora. I mean, I just work with uh, Ariano Sosa in New York, who's, who's my brother. And if he's watching, if he hasn't fallen asleep because he had a couple of Coronas, what's up, my brother? Um, and Yo. and and he's building a tremendous stable of fighters over in Brooklyn from, you know, from from the ground up. Ismael Salas, um, the Cuban trainer. I've been fortunate the last couple of years that I've been able to work with a lot of Ismael's fighters, and and I'm I'm really grateful for that because aside from him being a great trainer, he is a tremendous guy and a tremendous friend. Exactly, and I'm glad you uh, touched on on Marie and um, and Wild Card. You know, I spoke to Marie uh, briefly today, which was golden because when she's working, it's it's hard to get a hold of her. She'll say, "Rich, Richie, email me, email it to me," and then she'll confuse me. She goes, "Just text it to me." So she was good. she was uh, gonna pass over the message, and she said, "Freddie had some que- um, some questions, but I but I didn't get them." But uh, I'm sure I, I'm I'm curious to see what what was he gonna ask you. And I know Marie was very excited about by, by sharing today's show. And uh, she put in, in, in highlights, hey, our, our special friend, uh, Mike, is going to be on the show. And, I mean, just showing that love. And, and, and I'm from afar, so I can imagine how you feel when you walk in there and just being embraced and just feeling the real, true love and support. Well, you know, I went over there for, uh, for Christmas, and when I got there, there was a big wild card bag. And in that wild card bag was three brand-new wild card state-of-the-art, hot off the press, wild card um, sweatshirts that they had gotten for myself and my, my son, Andrew, and my son, Alex. Of course, I tried to pawn it off to them like I had bought them so I could get a little extra credit, there but I think they saw through, through me right there, but there's nothing wrong with trying to take some credit, right, especially on Christmas. Hey, especially on Christmas. Hey, Carol, are you with us now? Oh, okay, uh, well, she's working on, on, on uh, the hey, audio. Carol's, uh, Carol's having technical difficulties. We're going to have her use some sign language or something. I think there's just one, one measure away that you would press the volume. I Obviously, her and technology are not, you know, our best friends. You should have seen the first time I did a, uh, I had to do a Zoom call for some, uh, I had to actually do a Zoom call for to take a COVID test yeah. when I worked. Jessica McCaskill and Rick Ramos um, it said, hey, you got to call this number and you got to do this. And for whatever reason, I was having problems like Carol. It just it just, it just, wouldn't work. And I was going crazy because it was the last day before I, I, I had to, uh, to take that test so I could go work her fight. But hopefully she gets through it. I, I hope so. Hey, I got a question for you, Mike. This is, question is from Sean Porter. It says, um, who is the two-time uh, WBC Waltzweight champion of the world. IBF, IBF, and WBC. Yes, IBF and WBC, yes, correct. I'll stand corrected. Uh, ask Mike to compare boxing with his day job, and how are they different, and how are they alike? It's a great question. If you ever uh, saw that movie, we, we Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson, somebody asked him about being a father and then being a commander, a colonel with his things, and he said he hopes that being good at one makes you being good at another. And Sean and I have been through the wars. Sean had fights where he was really cut bad with Alfonso Gomez on Showtime, two fights with Julio Diaz, when he won the title from Devin Alexander, when he lost the title to Kel Brook. It was like a total team effort. Obviously, he's doing all the heavy lifting in the ring. But it's because of my military fighting background, being in law enforcement, specifically being a homicide detective, 
that the preparation and the devil's always in the detail. It's better to have and not need than to need and not have. Hey, Carol, how you doing? There you are. I'm good. Good. Uh, so, the show's almost over. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so it's just a matter of being prepared, Richard, that you have to hope for the best, but you have to plan for the worst. And, and I think with, you, you form a special bond with a fighter that you go through those things with. I've been like that with El Bandido, Francisco Vargas, with Julian J. Rock Williams, um, with Sergey Lipinets. What do these guys all have? They got world championship pedigree. And hopefully some of the work that I did and was able to do got them through those fights and helped them be at that championship level. And I'm proud of that. A good deal. I'm going to ask one question. We're going to move on to Carol right after this question. And this one, she kind of answers a question herself. This is coming in from Brittany Goose in Brown. She goes, plain and simple, ask Mike, who's his favorite? Brittany. <laughs> she goes, it's me. Ha ha. Yeah. You know, I just, I happened to see Brittany uh, recently. She was at the last PBC show and I hadn't seen Brittany in months. And because of the COVID, the COVID protocols, and when you know, I, I'm, it's like a traveling circus, man. I, I I'm used to seeing Ray Flores, and 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 Brittany. You know, I don't ever see him, you know, locally in L.A., but I see him in every major city in the world. And 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 you talk about championship pedigree and family pedigree. This is something that's been instilled in her since she was probably didn't even realize it as a little girl. I was great friends with her with her with her with her uncle Dan. Her uncle Joe, I'm still great friends with. Her dad, Tom, is the TGB promoter now, but Tom is a legendary, I mean, legendary uh, matchmaker. I mean, he is a very, very smart man. I have tremendous respect for the, the entire Goosen family. And, and when you see what the things that Brittany has done and what she is entrusted with, it speaks volumes about her capabilities and the talents that she has. So yeah, Brittany, you're 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 my favorite. Carol, oh. Carol, everything's rocking and rolling now. How you doing, Carol? I'm doing great, thank you. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Doing better now that I can hear you and see you. That's great. Now I got to get caught up because I'm totally blind right now. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. I just I just joined the uh, show, so it's um I got to get caught up on what you know, what you. Okay, so we were just kind of talking about. Just earlier, some of the the, the historical cut men that that paved that paved the way. And we're talking about guys even before Stitch Duran, you know. Uh -huh. and, and we're talking about guys that maybe you've never even you know heard of, um, but going back into the '50s, '60s, '70s, and '80s. And I did a lot of research, you know, during the pandemic. And when I had a question about somebody, I would call a Danny Milano, or I'd call uh, Miguel Diaz, and I'd call Ruben. Mm -hmm. I'd call Ruben Gomez or even my, my partner, Ruben Chavez, who I worked at the PVC fights with here because these guys, if they didn't go back that far, they were connected to guys that, that they were connected to guys that did. And I mm -hmm. think it's important. Some of the things that I don't know if you heard or not, and you know, I'm always a hundred percent honest with somebody's my 12th best friend or my best friend. I'm always going to be honest with them. I just see a lot of people with a lot of self gloss anointing themselves the next best thing with a, their own shirt or a funny hat when you should build your brand by letting your work speak for itself. And I just think those are some of the things that, that we were talking about and just the, the landscape of the fight scene now and working in the bubble. And I'm grateful, Carol, because I know there's a lot of people right now, especially that work MMA or that didn't get hired by one of the major promoters, they're not working right now. And it's got to be tough because I've worked with some fighters that I probably wouldn't have worked with because they had their own cut men. And now because right. I'm hired promoter, I'm working with them. And I always try to show and talk to those guys with great respect. Like, Hey man, I'm not trying to steal your guy because you know what? Some of my guys have gone and fought in top rank shows. Some of my guys have fought it over in Connecticut on Showtime, but I'm entrusting them with guys like Danny Milano and Mike Basil and, and Stitch Duran and, and, and other guys around the country. So hopefully we get back to, I don't think we're ever going to get back to normal, normal as we knew it, but it's going to be a new normal, and hopefully it's, 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 it's a better normal. Right. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, you're very fortunate that, um, you know, just like, um, you know, Stitch Duran and Mike Basil and, 
And unfortunately, there's a lot of us, like you said, that aren't as fortunate, uh, you know, as 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 you and and the others. But hopefully, we get back to the normal at some point. Um, but it is hard just sitting and waiting, and and hopefully getting some work. And um, but it is it is difficult. But I'm I'm I still admire your work and 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 what you do and the passion that you have and. Um, it's it's something that you know I admire, and so it's it's nice to still watch you every fight that I see you in. I watch you, and I I, I see everything that you do, and um, so I, I admire your work, and it's something that helps me. Thank you, and and that's just something that like I didn't I didn't invent. You know, it was just something that I took the traits and the positive things that I do naturally with input from others and it's like you know making that good chicken soup you know somebody's going to add the somebody's going to add the chicken and you're going to add the spices and you're going to add the vegetables and right. it, and in the end you got to be yourself because what works for you may not work for me i know mm-hmm. yeah, i'm very anal about about preparation i have nightmares sometimes that that mm-hmm. i'm up there and i don't have everything that i need and and it's getting tough for cutting and i'm going to tell you and you probably know this you know, about a year, a little over a year ago, the Cutman medicine that we're allowed to use, you know, they stopped making the one that was very affordable. And, and it's hard for Cutman now to, to get the medicine. And just like the good old pharmaceutical business that you can always count on to do the right thing, um, you know, they jacked the price of something that used to cost $30 to about $300. I know. And, and I, I, I get mad for selfish reasons, but then I think about poor people that actually need medicine that they do this to and other you know, and, and, and other type of medications. So I'm not going to complain too much because they need it for life saving and, you know, for health reasons. And I'm, I need it, you know, so that, so, so that I can work in, 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 in the fight business. Right. No, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. It's very, it's hard to come by and it's very expensive, but you know, but like you said, it, you know, there are other uses for it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are some of the things, Carol? I'm going to ask you this: when 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 you watch a fight, because you probably watch a fight a little different than the average person, just like I do. Like when I'm watching a fight from ringside that I'm working, and people afterwards say, "Hey, what'd you think of the scoring?" I'm like, I'm looking at it in a completely different way. What are some of the things that stand out to you when you watch when you watch a cut man work? What are some of the things that that you focus on? Um, I actually I'm I'm watching what. A cut man is doing in between the rounds pretty much i i used to really watch just the fight you know i was more into the actual event the box the the fighters and what they're doing but now as a cut person i'm watching what the cut person is doing what you're doing and um what your techniques are and how you're handling the fighter and um, and just kind of seeing what each person is doing. And everybody has different techniques and different styles. And I learn something from each and every person and how they do things. And then I kind of take things from that and do, you know, learn something and, and kind of make it my own way. Um, you know, and it's funny because when I, when I watch you, for instance, I get pissed off sometimes because – if the camera angle isn't right, you know, I get pissed because I go, oh, God dang, you know, I, I can't see what you're doing, you know, because someone's in the way. And you, that, you and my mom are the only two people in the world that get mad at that. <laughs> you know, because it's like someone's head gets in the way and it's like, damn, I can't see, I can't see what you're doing, move, you know. So it's funny, but that's really important to me. And um, yeah, I learn from, from everyone. And, uh, you know, there's something to learn from from every single fight and every single cut person. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I have a, I kind of have a saying, and sometimes in life and whatever we do, we learn what to do, but sometimes you also learn from people what not to do, you know, and you're maybe not going to be vocal and shout that out to put anybody on blast, but I've learned what not to do exactly. from absolutely. a lot of people as well because, you know, boxing is a weird sport. Everybody's cool with you until they think that you've moved ahead of them, and then they start uh, a little bit of hating, hating starts. Oh yeah, um, and the the great thing about some of the guys that I mentioned, you know, with with Stitch and, and Baz and, and Rudy and, and and Danny and Russ and Aaron and Bobby and all these guys and Carlos Vargas, um, is we're all great friends. You know, um, we're we're all great friends. Is that a lot of times, you know, we'll go have dinner with each other, and we, even though we're working opposite each other, and 
and it's, it's a good feeling because I'm happy because we're working at a championship level. And we're uh-huh. there. there's a lot of people in this sport. And I, when you really go to every gym in the world and every gym in California, United States, and see all the trainers and everybody in there, uh-huh. there's only a small majority, and I, sometimes we take it for granted, that have worked a world title fight. Right. Okay, to, to work a world title fight. And when I look at, I did some research on the legendary cut men, Al Gavin and, and Ace Murata and, and, and some of these guys, Joe Souza and Ralph Citro. You know, they were all veterans of over 100 world title fights. Wow. That's my goal. That's my goal. And I'm sure Stitch has, has surpassed that as well. But that's my goal. And it's something that I talked to, you know, to Mike Basil about because me and Baz, you know, you we're not just two cut men. If you really look at it, we're the wedding crashers. You know what I mean? He's. I know wedding. totally, Vince Vaughn. <laughs> yeah. First time I ever came on the show, Richard, you know, posted that goofy picture of us looking like <laughs> wedding crashers. But you know, me and Mike only compete with one thing: about who gets up to the ring fastest, faster, well, shorter. So he's got to take those short steps. I'm a little taller, so I can kind of do the Andre the Giant thing and just get up there. Totally. But I think the one thing is you got to give every second counts. Every uh-huh. single second counts, and you got to have that interior clock where you know your time and stuff right. And there's been times, and Sean Porter can attest to this, I know he's cut, and they're saying get out of the ring, and I'm telling them, you stay seated until mm-hmm. I move. They can right. yell at me all they want. I want to get every second possible because it, that, that, that second of being able to treat that trauma may be That's the right. difference proud of him being able to go out and do what he needs to do that's right yeah a lot of people don't you know understand that um other than the cut person um but every second counts just like you said yes absolutely there are are tricks to get into the ring though right i mean there are different tricks to try to get into the ring whether it's grabbing that rope sliding yourself in or just running up to the you know running up those steps you know, I, I'm such a preparation uh, person, Carol, that I even before the fights even start, I talk to the cameraman. Ah. And, I, and they probably think, hey, is this guy trying to get extra TV time? Well, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and that's so I can do my thing with, with my ear that, that kind of says hello to my mom and my, and my Uncle Bobby, my Uncle Tony, and, and my cousin. Uh-huh. Um, I kind of do that. And then, I, you know, I do a salute for, you know, all the people that wear a uniform that, that, that defend our country. I try to get that in just as a show. Oh, bless you. I want to know sometimes where these cameramen are because sometimes they try to position themselves in the spot that you need to be in. I'm a big guy, so I take up I take up a lot of room. Um, so it, it's those, those little small things. Um, how are the stairs? How steep are the stairs? Right. How, how tight are the ropes? I've gone through ropes where I can't get my big head and my ears between. Be between and I've I've actually had my back go out on me, get stuck, and I got a camera, you know, on my lower back, and I got stuck, and my back went out. And I literally had to tell somebody to peel me off underneath the ropes and help me down the stairs. I've oh fallen, my god! I've, I've fallen off the apron at StubHub. My son and I were working a fight. I thought it was the apron. It was actually a false bottom. I actually fell all, off the whole apron and and went down there. And here's my son, who's my son, is supposed to be looking out for his pops. He's standing on the apron laughing at me. Oh, no. Yeah. So anything, that's crazy. Anything, anything can go wrong in that, in that corner. That's it, true. It, it can go wrong, and that's why you got to be prepared for everything. That's right. No, you, you definitely said that right. Did Richard leave? Did he go get a pizza over there? I don't know, but we're just talking shop. That's all yeah. I care about. <laughs> this is a great conversation. You, you let it ride, man. I, I was waiting for uh, Mike to tell me who shot Kennedy. So – my, my, you mentioned pedigree today. You mentioned it over and over on the show. I kind of want to put you on, on the hot seat. I kind of know what direction you're going to go. But you've had the opportunity of working the corner of Spence and also Manny Pacquiao. What did you notice if, if they hinted on any, any type of something where you just said to yourself, wow, they're here because of, of that reason. I see that special something in that fighter. And in Manny, I see it in him. And in Spence, I see it in this direction. What, what did you see? What made you smile to yourself? That you just have this feeling of confidence in their abilities. And they're world champions. And there's, 
that word gets thrown around a lot, but there are certain world champions. I worked a fight that uh, Freddie Roach sent me to, to Moscow, Russia with Dennis, De Dennis Lebedev, hmm. uh, cruiserweight champ of the world. And there I am in Moscow, Russia. Hmm. And I'm thinking, there's 20,000 people in this arena and they're singing and they're chanting his name. And I just, the look on his face, like, this is where I'm supposed to be. Wow. And then I get to the ring with Francisco Vargas on uh, HBO when he fought Orlando Salido. And they're playing his music. And you can just look at these guys. I mean, there's other people in the stands that are more excited and more nervous. And you walk with a Sean Porter and a Julian J. Rock Williams and Pacquiao and Spence. And I've been fortunate enough to work, you know, with almost, you know, 20 world champions. And there is something that separates them because a lot of them I actually knew when they were just starting off. Mm -hmm. And you see extra something in them where sometimes I look at a kid like Elvis Rodriguez, mm -hmm. one of the latest protégés, and there's something about him when I see him in the gym. Not even in, I see it in the fights, but you just see like, okay, this kid's going to be a world champion. You know, a Jose Lito Velasquez, um, um, Jesus Ramos, the young kid, you know, from Casa Grande, Arizona, Abel Ramos's nephew. You look at these guys and you're like, these guys are going to be world champions. That's great. Real quick, wow. when you worked with Spence real quick, it, it, what, what made him special to you? You know, I had a chance to work with Errol probably his first 11 fights. I probably worked eight of them. Mm -hmm. um, my buddy Todd Harlib, God rest his soul, and I, who was a great friend, and he's been gone four years. Um, we were kind of going back and forth, and then he kind of took over the duties. Um, and I bet there's a story behind that. Errol was an Olympian. He was a national champion. You could just tell by the way he approached his fights. And I look for, and I look for that, that confidence, that calm confidence that somebody has. When you look at, excuse me, all your great athletes, your Kobe Bryant, your LeBron James, your Michael Jordan, your Tom Brady, what are they all really? They're cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your Muhammad Ali, your Ray Leonard's, there's just this coolness about them. You're a little older like me, so you remember, like, I remember when I was a little, little kid, you saw Walt Clyde Frazier, you know, from the Knicks, Earl the Pearl Monroe. <laughs> Magic. These guys were just cool. And I just think when you, when, you, when, you, when you see guys like that, there's not you can there's nothing you can put one finger on and say that's what it is, but when you see it, like a Manny Pacquiao. I, right. remember, I remember about a week and a half before Pacquiao fought Thurman, I was in the gym with them every day. And Freddie looked at me and just kind of said, and he was with Justin Fortune, and they know Manny, you know, so well because they worked with him so long. I was new to Manny's team, not new to working with Freddie and Justin, but new working with Manny. And Sean Gibbons was there. And big shout out to Sean, Viva Sean, because he's one of the best dudes in the whole. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And they were, he was, they were just like, he's ready. Like, we could fight tomorrow night. Huh. You know, we this guy would be ready. And you're looking at, you're looking at, with Manny, you're looking at greatness. I remember, and you, Richard, you sent this video to me because I think you posted it during the national anthem. You know, I saved this video and I still send it to people like a dummy. <laughs> and they're ready with our back and they're playing the national anthem. And I've worked, I've been fortunate. I've worked a lot of big fights in Vegas, New York, Philly, you know, you name it. I've, I've worked in England. But standing there with Manny Pacquiao, the national anthem is not even done yet. And you can hear everybody yelling, 20,000 people at the MGM Grand, pay-per-view in Vegas, and you can start hearing that chant of Manny. I mean, I wanted to go in like Ultimate Warrior style. <laughs> I wanted to get in the ring, you know what I mean? Yeah. And somebody like a Stone Cold Stunner or, a, you know, something like that. Of course, I went down the stairs and sat my ass down and did my job. But that's <laughs> That's just the electricity, how you feel. And anybody that works a fight, even though you might not be fighting, a part of us still, a part of us feeds off that energy. And that's why, you know, hopefully these vaccines work and we can get back to a, a, a new normal where people can start interacting with each other. We can all stop hating each other. We can just yes. agree, agree and stop hating each other. Um, and that's what I love about boxing. We, you know, we can all fight about boxing stuff and 
who's on the A side and who's on the wrong side of the fence. We don't want to fight who. But if somebody else comes to fight us, you know what? Stand by because we're all gonna we're all gonna band together and we're gonna kick your ass. That's right. We're all going home with guys. Carol, I mean, I, you're 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 uh, a close friend of yours, or, or uh, should I say more? I want to take this time to celebrating a birthday. So to J Rock, my man. I mean E Rock. There we go. E Rock. Happy birthday, Eric. Yeah, actually, um, he actually has a question that he'd like to ask um, Mike, if that's okay. Absolutely. Bring him on. Bring him on. Okay. He has a question. Here he goes. Okay. Yo, what up? What up, man? What's happening? What's going on? How you doing, Mike? I'm, I'm doing good, man. Just uh, debating now whether I'm going to eat for dinner. Is it going to be uh, – Something healthy, you know. I, I can. My diet's good when I'm not hungry, but as soon as I get hungry, you know, lights out. Right. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to talk to you. You know, I look up to you. You're the Thank greatest you. out there right now. So I mean, yeah. I love it. Appreciate that. And I love the sport of boxing. So, I mean, I don't miss an event. And uh, so it, it, it's it's a real big pleasure. And it's my birthday today too. So a happy birthday! Tw Twenty three today. Yep, you got it. You nailed it right there. <laughs> That's my favorite year, so I just kind of stick with that one. <laughs> All right, I will too. Then I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep that on notes. Um, my question to you is: uh, your first major pay per view event that you ever worked. Um, what was that like for you? Uh, the experience, oh. like, was it? Were you were you nervous? Did yes. it get in the way of your work at all? And did you? My my question also following that is: did you have a cut that you did end up having to attend for that fight? Yes, you know, it was about. Ten years ago, I'd been working for a couple of years, and I get a call from legendary Hall of Fame manager Cameron Duncan. Cameron Duncan managed Mike Garcia, Nonito Dunair, Terrence Crawford. And he manages Paul Wolak. And he had fought Delvin Rodriguez on ESPN several months before where he got a hematoma on his head, and he looked like the elephant man. Oh, wow. Uh, trainer, and he calls me, and he says, Mike – can you handle this job? I've seen you working the last couple of years. This is a big, this was my step up fight. Can you handle it? And I said, yes, Cameron, I can. He says, okay, I'm booking you a ticket to the Mecca, Madison Square Garden, HBO uh -huh. pay-per-view. And there I was um, working with uh, Hall of Fame trainer, Tommy Brooks, um, an assistant trainer, terrific guest. And Paul Wolak was one of those guys, as Joe Chavez liked to put it, he swells up when he comes out of the dressing room. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So I actually iced him in the dressing room, even though he started to get a little bit of swelling. Um, even he was surprised afterwards uh, about how I was able to keep the swelling down. And it was just because I paid attention to detail. I didn't overlook anything. He didn't get cut except for a bloody lip and, and a nose. But he just had one of those faces that was going to always swell up. And I was really, really happy. And that kind of like kind of got me over the hump a little bit because when you're seen with really good people it's like going to the club or the dance they see you dancing with a bunch of heavyweights nobody wants to dance with you right and as soon as you pull that dime everybody else starts looking like oh, okay i see you i see you working right yeah oh I, I never did that mom just let my mom know that you know i was just kind of the guy that sat in the back so <laughs> all right man that's 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 great man that's good to hear glad you're still doing your thing and um What's the next one coming up? You know, I, um, it looks like the PBC on January 30th here in L.A., Caleb Plant against Caleb Truex. Right. Uh, as you know, because you're a fight fan, a lot of fights are getting announced. I'd imagine that these other uh, that you're going to start seeing a lot of action in February and March, and I'm looking forward to getting back, um, getting back busy, um, you know, because I've had this little break for two weeks now, and I got about another two-week break. And, um, you know, the, night, the break was nice because I literally worked fights from uh, – from the end of July all the way until, until New Year's, you know, once or twice a week, which I, I'm very grateful. Um, but, you know, hey, the break's over. Holidays are over. I ate, like, I don't know, like 49 tamales in four days. I actually <laughs> ate while I was on the treadmill. How sad is that, bro? I actually ate a tamale while I was on the treadmill. Oh, so, <laughs> the uh, struggle. I'm ready. Uh, the struggle's real, man. I'm ready to get yeah. back to work, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm grateful for the work. And I, it's been good talking to you. Happy birthday, man. I appreciate you. Thank you, man. Hey, great hey. question, too, Eric. Thank you. Eric, real quick before you leave. Hey, how's What's that up? soundtrack coming along for the Fighter's Voice, man? I'm just curious, man. It hasn't dropped yet, man. I'm, I'm waiting to hear the lyrics on that. 
It's coming. It's coming. Just like the album. I got my album coming out too. So okay. So it's gonna be all good. I'm gonna drop everything. All right. Good. Good, good luck to you, Eric. Thank you, E. Appreciate you, man. Good talking with you. You too, brother. Hey, hey Mike. I gotta ask you this question, and, and I want to. I want to end with this. What well, watching your son Andrew work. And, and knowing that he's been a student of the game, and, uh, of course, you've been a big inspiration in his life. When you see him work, what features in, in, do you see in him that, that are in you? I mean, that, that he took from you. Is there a part that you see him move or he goes, okay, he got this, I, or you talk with yourself as if to say, okay, I know where you got that from. Good job, Mijo. Yeah, um, he's, he was a good athlete. He's very calm. He doesn't let the – the the crowd or the moment or the size of the fight affect him. That's what I'm most proud of. I remember he worked a fight with Sergey Lipinets against Lenny Zaparigny on the Julian Williams Jamal Charlo undercard. And Julian had asked me not to work with any fighters that night. And lo and behold, who was the fight before Julian was Sergey Lipinets in a title eliminator? Now I got to tell Lipinets his folks said, "Hey, because Julian's the main event, he's fighting for the world title. We had always had this agreement. I would only work with Julian that night." Um. And so I said, Andrew can handle the work. He'd already worked with some other guys. You know, it wasn't like he just showed up. And lo and behold, I'm watching the fight in the back, getting ready, Julian ready, and Lipinets and Zaparigny both get cut to shreds. And I'm like, man, I'm like, you know, you got this, man. You got this. And lo and behold, he did great. He, uh, he, he stopped. And I get back briefly to talk. And who's the trainer? Hall of Fame fighter, Hall of Fame trainer, Buddy McGirt. I mean, you're talking uh, about a kid. When I say kid, you know, we're talking five years ago now, but, you know, he was in his mid-20s, and Buddy told me, he goes, look, I go, how'd it go, Buddy? And Buddy goes, Mike, it was like having you there on the corner, man. He did great, and he's went on to work, you know, work big fights with, you know, some pretty big trainers and work with several numerous world title fights. I, I'm proud of that. And aside from how, how he does, whenever you – get to do something with somebody you love. There's nothing better than doing what you love with the ones you love most. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I, I, Alex does a lot of video stuff and he does, you know, he keeps very tied into the fight game. Alex, my younger son, was the one that actually went to the gym with me every day since he was eight, nine years old. It wasn't even Andrew. Andrew's a Johnny come lately as far as boxing. He was busy <laughs> playing football and sports and stuff. And Alex was the one that was actually in the gym with me. And we were just talking the other day that Alex actually sparred with Kung Lee when he was like 16 years old, and they were supposed to be going easy. And Kung cracked Alex, and Alex cracked him, and I damn near had to separate him. And we were laughing about that. <laughs> I'm like, man, so who do I choose here? I'm helping Kung with his, getting ready for his fight. I think when he fought, um, he was going to fight over in China. When he was going to fight Rich Franklin, and Kung happened to be in L.A., so I was working with him a little bit. And here, him and my son are going life and death in the sparring. So, you know, those are the things. <laughs> Those are the things that you remember. You you know, those are the, the, the little things that, that you remember that, that mean a lot. But it, it, I'm lucky, man, because my sons are adults, and I'm, a, I'm able to still be around them a lot, and, and I don't take that for granted. I don't take anything for granted. Now, I've, we've all lost so many people along the way, not just in the past, but but just this last year. And we've lost so many people, and, and my heart goes out to them because nothing, nothing – tomorrow's not promised. Mm -hmm. you know, advantage. I try to wake up each and every day and try to take advantage to make it a good day because this world and this life is, 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 is what we make it. And I'm a firm believer in we're blessed. Pass your blessings along. Pass mm -hmm. your blessings. I can help somebody out. I don't care if it's in boxing. I don't care if it's in life. I don't care if they need groceries. I'm just a phone call away, man. And, and, I, and I really mean that. And I, I get that because my parents are very giving people. Um, I was just raised that way, and, mm. and, and it's just something that, that, that's in my heart, and as you get older, you get more sentimental, and the, the things that didn't meet, mean that much to you in your 20s and 30s, you start getting your 40s and 50s, and you start seeing people along the way that are no longer here, and you wish they could be here. We all mm -hmm. have it, and, right. and I think that's, that, that's what means the most, and, and just making the most of your opportunity uh, on this earth. You know, and that, that's, that's the, the, if I have to leave on, on saying one thing, it, it would be that. Very well said, Mike. You know, that was, that was very well said. And I couldn't leave the show without um, giving your son the, the opportunity to be heard, his story. And, and no better way, in, in 2021, we got to make sure that we get uh, Andrew on, on the show. 
I mean, you know, all oh, yeah. to be is because I want him to spill the beans. I want to know how he's doing <laughs> professional. I want to know what's it really like being in front of, of this dude. What's he like on his free time? And you know what? He, where does he back he'll, off? He'll, he'll sit there and tell you, like, Dad, you're not that interesting. You come home from work, you go and <laughs> take a nap in your chonies, you watch the Clipper game or the <laughs> football game. He goes, you're not, you're not that intriguing. I guess, you know, your family <laughs> Your family looks at you in a, in, in, a, in a certain way. You know what I mean? My dad's probably scratching his head like, this guy was a guy that couldn't even, he wouldn't even do his homework or he'd forget to rake the leaves or mow the lawn, you know, and, you know, now he's <laughs> philosophically, you know, you know, sounding like, you know, Gandhi or something and talking about seeing Jesus in his menudo. So, you know, we, <laughs> we all have an evolution and a destination. It just takes some of us a little longer to get there. That's funny. Carol, before we dismiss, I know you got that special question for, for Mike, man. Go ahead and shoot that, and then uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, let's see. Um, Talk about putting you on the spot, huh? Yeah, I knew that. Uh, if you um, – let's say you, you've worked corners for two world champions – and they both had to fight each other. <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> okay. How 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 are you going to choose which corner Good that question. you would you know what I mean? Like are you I gonna be torn? I, are you gonna be torn which corner that you wanna work or Absolutely, you know, and it, it's trainers trainers have gone through this. I know Andre Rozier he had surveyed Devin Chico and Danny Jacobs. It's, it's heart-wrenching. It's heart-wrenching. I remember working a fight in Vegas with Julian J. Rock Williams. And who's he fighting? He's fighting Nathaniel Gallimore, who's out of my home gym. Over mm -hmm. and, and Nate thinks I'm going to be working with him. and we, That's my home gym, you know, that and wild card. And, and my son Andrew ends up working, you know, with, with, uh, with, with Nate. We worked opposite on Showtime. That uh -huh. was the old dating grace, but it's not easy because when these fighters get into fight mode, even though I was close and I was cool with Nate, it was a, it was a different dynamic. It was just me and my son kept saying all week, like, man, we just I just want to get through this week. Uh -huh. I just want to do this week because you know you're you. I'm rooting for my son, but I'm also rooting for my fighter. You know, and, right. and I have feelings. You know, I very I, I like Nate a lot, and 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 but Julian's my fighter, and I and I love Jules. You know, and Stephen Edwards is the bread man. And, you know, I just looked at an old fight card, and I've been with Julian over 10 years. That's a long time to be working with one fighter over oh, 10 yeah. years. In this sport, you know, guys bounce around and stuff. I've worked, literally, I'm in my 11th year with working Julian, with Ju um, Julian Williams. So um, those are the kind of things that, you know, you, you don't take for granted. And it's a really good question because, you know, the, the elephant in the room is, you know, some of the guys that we've mentioned that I work mm -hmm. with, third yeah. grade classes may be fighting each other. Yeah, you know? I know. And and but you know, I'm always gonna go. I'm always gonna be loyal to those that have always been loyal to loyal me. To and I'll put it that, and that'll answer it. I agree with that. That's that's very good. That's very good. Okay, guys, we're not going anywhere right now. This question just came in, and this is a must. And and I'm honored and flattered to to, to read this. Hi, Richard. So Freddie wants to know, which of course is Freddie Roach wants to know what got Mike into boxing. And what made him decide to become a cut man? Something he's never asked Mike. Freddie says, I just wonder about that. Aww. You know, this is coming from the legend himself. Let me, let me give him the proper introduction. This is coming from the legend himself. The man, the myth, the legend, the walking, rocking star himself, Mr. Freddie Roach, owner, CEO of Wildcard Jam. Wildcard. His assistant with him, Marie. Aww. And, 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 I, and I, I love them both. Um, you know, it's the quiet times in, in, in the gym where I've had to be able to spend private time, not just on fight stuff with Freddie and Marie. You know, they've become like family. And I knew because of my regular job and because of the landscape and boxing, and I kind of got back into it kind of late. I was realistic. I was never going to be able to compete with Freddie Roach. I mean, who can? I mean, he was mentored by one of the greatest trainers of all time, and he's now become one of the greatest trainers, if not of all time, you know, but with, with, by Eddie Futch. 
that, you know, he's the Mickey Mantle, the Joe DiMaggio, you know, the Babe Ruth. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I tried to find something that I could do to stay and hopefully someday work at a top level. Mm. And have the trust of somebody like Freddie and, and some of the other trainers that I mentioned, it makes you want to do better to step up your game because you're working with some fighters, Hall of Fame fighters, Hall of Fame trainers. And if I can be mentioned in that breath that I'm associated with them, that hopefully I'm doing something right. I think I am doing something right. But the one thing is I'm grateful. I don't take it for granted. And, and that I always want to give them my best. I would never want to let Freddie down. I wouldn't let Freddie down. I would jump in a pit full of rattlesnakes for Freddie and Marie. You know, mm. and other people that I've mentioned. Um, an old baseball coach of mine used to tell us that when we used to leave practice. He says, go home and do something nice for your mother because she'd jump in a pit full of rattlesnakes or a pit full of crocodiles for you. And that's... That's that's how I feel about that. So um, it was just a it was a it wasn't my original destination, you know. It wasn't my original what I thought my original destination was. But in life, you know, sometimes you take a turn here and there, and you end up in a better place. And I and I think I have, and I'm I'm fortunate to be where I'm at because of people like because of people like them and and, and others. Hopefully that answers the question. Well, I'm, I'm looking at it. It says what got you into boxing, and what made you decide being a cut man. You know, boxing is something that, you know, I remember my dad taking us to the gym and, you know, we literally sparred like the second day and we got our ass kicked. But <laughs> back to it earlier was I remember being in my Uncle Joe's house and, and watching fights of, you know, of Ali and Norton and Frazier and Foreman with some of my uncles that I mentioned. And it's just something that, that was there for us as far as that brought us together, you know, that brought us together, you know, and, and, and I was I'm nothing – compared to these fighters that I work with. You know, all the things that they have, I realize I didn't have, you know. Um, but to be able to have a part in that now, to be able to still be in, in boxing in some way, shape, or form, and, and to transition into being a cut man, and, and to being around and working with all the wonderful people that I mentioned, I mean, it's like I'm living a dream. I get to work at a high level at both my jobs, you know, I can literally retire in 51 days from my job with the sheriff's department. I've been in a homicide bureau. I just started my 17th year there. You know, I'm, by the grace of God, I may just go one more year only because I feel like it. If I have three bad days in a row, I'm done. I'm done. And then my mom can expect me to see me sleeping on the couch, you know, a couple times a month. And my, yeah. dad, will, my dad will tell me to wash my hand and take off my shoes, and he'll still probably tell me what time to go to bed. Because <laughs> in the end, he's still my, he's still my dad. Um, oh. I see now, and I, I don't take for granted that that <laughs> everything that I get to do now, and my family gets to see me on TV. Is it, I hear from my from my Nino and my uncles, and my mom is okay. I let your uncles know, and, and it just it's something that fills my heart. And in this life, if you have something that your passion fills your heart, oh yeah, you know, and then you're, you're it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank, you're a rich person, and that's exactly how I feel. Very well, oh. that's a great answer. That's a good answer there. You know what? I, I want to thank our guest tonight. I want to thank uh, Carol for, for getting that mic on. And I'm glad because your questions have really been the ones that really had Mike thinking. Kind of you put him up against the rope, so to speak. And, and also, Eric had some great questions, and I'm glad he was able to get his uh, birthday gift. Actually, Mike, here's a short story. He was coming on, and he was absolutely – can I ask this guy a question? It is my birthday. I watch him. Uh, Carol can't ask the question like I can because Carol works with him as a professional. I want to ask him a question. We put him on. We make things happen here at the Fighter's Voice. I want to thank you, Mike, for, for taking time to, to come on to the show and not only just come on and, and talk but get in-depth and, and educate those – that are listening and also give those that have been waiting to hear their name to know that they have been the, 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 the founding fathers that have opened the door and paved the way for you yourself, the stitches, and even the future of, of boxing. And that's closing these cuts to keep these fighters safe and into the fight. Absolutely. And that's what we talked about before I came on is, you know, I've been on the show a couple of times and we always have a good time. But I think one of the things that I've done during this quarantine and this pandemic is I've had a chance to research and really reflect. And I really wanted, I really wanted to bring to the forefront. I didn't want to leave anybody out because I get to do what I get to do and what we do 
because of a lot of these people that I mentioned, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm grateful for that. And I thank you for giving me the platform, you know, to, to do that. A- absolutely. Carol, it's good um, having you back, man. It's just like yesterday. You, you were on the show, and you were rocking the mic with us, having fun. And that, that, that's, that's something that we got to relive in 2021, man. And uh, we, we got to get you back in the mix because uh, you do open up a lot of doors, and you know, not just for the for the fight fans, but also for the women that are out there that, that may be afraid to open up their mouth and, and, and take that step forward. My daughter being one of them. So I'm definitely yes. uh, towards you. Well, and, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And I want to thank all the viewers and the fans and also the new uh, subscribers. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I appreciate your subscription to The Fighter's Voice. Our YouTube channel is www.youtube.com slash The Fighter's Voice. Every fighter has a voice, and so do you. And I look forward to this Tuesday. We have with us the future Hall of Famer, the man that puts it all together when it comes to matchmaking for top-ranked boxing, and that's the one and only Bad Brad Goodman. Way of Zoom. I almost said studio, and I'm going to tell you a quick story. I was talking to Lee Samuels today, and this is what he told me, Mike. He said, Richard, how do I get uh, Brad to the show? What do I have to do? And I said, we're doing it by Zoom. He was also oh, <laughs> down there or anything like that. I go, no, no. Right now we're doing it with, with all pure Zoom. No excuses. No, no, no excuses. So I, I look for a, a great show Tuesday, and make sure you guys send me your questions, and we'll send them to Brad. We'll have a good time. And uh, I want to thank Sean Porter, who was on the show just uh, last night. And uh, once again, I want to thank Mike. And allowing me, uh, Richard Ortiz, your host, to uh, come in your living room, your car, wherever it's at, man, and uh, just share the boxing ring with you. Hey, as always, it's a wrap here. Thumbs up for Richie. Okay, fight Thanks, man. Mike. It's not goodbye, but Thanks, guys. Let's love Remember, remember, remember. It's always voiceography at its finest. So on behalf of Richard Ortiz, Cole Escovito, the special guests, and all the crew right here at the Kick-Ass Podcast, saying hasta luego, babies. And oh.